Good morning, Dan and Amy. So is uh, Michael Wolf going to flame out faster than the man who brought him into the White House? It seems like... Uh, it's losing steam. It's losing steam, and uh, there's a lot of people turning on Michael Wolf that are not necessarily allies of President Trump in any way, shape, or form. The journalists that uh, just don't feel like he's a member of the club because he doesn't abide the same standards that they purport to. Although some are certainly trying to dumb down their standards to include Wolf because they like what his book contends of Trump being mentally unfit for the office. And so we get notionally correct and ringing true as new standards. It's really been a rather remarkable week. But the other problem uh, with uh, Wolf's narrative, uh, and, and again, I'm sure this was in part a response to it, is Trump's performance, as he said in his cabinet meeting yesterday, the day before with congressional leaders from both parties to discuss a deal on DACA that uh, doesn't ring true uh, with respect to uh, comporting with Michael Wolf's assertions about Trump and what people think of him and how well he thinks. For more on this topic, we're pleased to be joined by presidential historian Doug Weed, the author of a new book, Game of Thorns. Oh, I see what he did there. Uh huh. Mm-hmm. Oh, I don't know if R. R. Martin's going to be okay with that. The inside story of Hillary Clinton's failed campaign and Donald Trump's winning strategy. Doug Weed, thanks so much for joining us. Appreciate it. <laughs> Thank you for having me. Um, so, um, what uh, what what about uh, the uh, D.C. press corps? general response to uh, Michael Wolf's book, try as they might to, uh, you know, prop him up. There are just a lot of voices that are, you know, like David Brooks that suggests that uh, it's worth reading, but, uh, you know, don't um, don't take it as the definitive word on the president. Yeah, I think some of them are kind of caught because they they like the intentions, the, the, good, the good intentions, if you will, of the author, but uh, <laughs> there, there's a limit to how much they can bend the journalism <laughs> to fit their own narrative. So some of them have just felt like this. To lead the national news with, with uh, a book like this, uncooperated. My book, for example, has 900 references in it. It took three months for the Hachette attorneys to go line by line. Mm. I had to prove anything in quotes. I had to prove it. And I once got in serious trouble with Simon & Schuster because I had to prove some quotes, and they turned out to be my own personal tape recordings of the President of the United States, and I got all kinds of grief for it. So to compare a normal book with this book, and then to lead the national news, I think some of the journalists kind of got caught with their pants down, and they're trying to backtrack a little bit. Yeah, so especially what, Mark Halperin. He gets caught with his pants on all the time. <laughs> so what do you think should happen to Michael Wolf? I mean, yesterday during President Trump's uh, first cabinet meeting of the year, he said he wants to go after the country's libel laws. Do you think that that's a, a good idea, or is that just a knee-jerk reaction to the bad press he was getting because of this book? Well, there are some for for years who thought we should uh, tack back a little bit on those libel laws. My own book that I wrote, we included the money laundering with the Chinese government, with the Clintons. We had to carefully weigh every bit of that. We had attorneys just pouring over a single word. Should we change this word to this word because of the potential of lawsuits? I think it, it, it wouldn't hurt to tack back just a little bit. When someone knows that what they're writing is wrong and is not true, and they're actually confronted with the evidence and told so, and they still go ahead and publish something that's false that hurts somebody, uh, even though they're in public life, seems like maybe a little tiny tack back, not mm. too much. Well, I mean, there is that. that that's, yeah, that's the actual malice standard for a public, uh, a public figure for libel. Uh, uh, so well, it is, but there are cases where some of the networks, uh, they actually had video footage of the network, very clear libel, and the judges uh, are not going to go against a major television network. Mm-hmm. So even with the evidence, 
uh, they didn't do anything. For, for for your book, you just kind of referenced that you had the occasion to spend time with President Trump. Yes, I did. Uh-huh. And so your impressions, and I know your field is uh, your training is in the field of presidential history, not psychology. But your impressions of President Trump, given all of the furor and the Democrats' uh, invocation of the Twenty Fifth Amendment and Yale psych professor saying he we should uh, commandeer the president and subject him to an emergency mental evaluation and all this sort of thing. <laughs> well, I have a theory, a historic theory, that I call dumb and duller, and that is that most Republican candidates are eventually portrayed as dumb, no matter who they are, and most Democrats as dull. Their reset years, Kennedy wasn't dull and Nixon wasn't dumb, but other than those reset years, there's Dole, Dukakis, and Gore, and Obama, and on and on the list goes. People say, why couldn't he have acted like that when he ran for president? He was so wooden. He was so stiff. And Republican presidents have been called dumb from the beginning. Uh, one of Lincoln's uh, cabinet officers wrote his wife and constantly referred in his letters to our dear imbecile, referring to Lincoln. <laughs> Bush Sr. was dumb because he read Ludlum instead of Lucare. Bush Jr. was dumb. Was dyslexia. They're all dumb. Reagan's dumb. Ford doesn't know how to walk. Uh, so there's nothing new that now here's yeah. another Republican, and of course they're dumb. At least, well, at least Reagan got, was an amiable dunce, according to Clark yes. Clifford. He got, yeah, at least he got amiable out so of So were you able to have any uh, interaction with Hillary Clinton or Bill Clinton for your book? No, I didn't, but I did with a lot of their staff and okay. people who had worked with them for many, many years. Is she mentally fit? Important information. <laughs> <laughs> I think she is. Listen, you can't get that far without being very, very sharp. I don't know how it works in your industry, but I can tell you, having worked on senior staff at the White House, some of the most brilliant, unbelievably calculated people I've ever met in my life end up on senior staff there. So it's not quite the cartoon it looks like from a distance. And from your interactions with those in Trump's inner circle, is it is it uh, close to what David Brooks said that you know some people respect him, some people think he's a little odd, but he's, but he, he you know it's it's he's on, right on substance. Some people think he's you know, you can work around him, and some people think he's a little goofy sometimes, or it, kind of a mixed bag of opinions. Is that a fair assessment uh, from your interactions and and conversations? Yeah, most of the people that I spoke with who are around Trump would not let their guard down to me. They would not roll their eyes. They would not do anything. They would keep an absolute straight face, not even a smirk, when something would be said that would be a bit outrageous. But uh, as a historian, as someone who's been a student of history, you have to appreciate we're going through a very big shift, political shift. We are moving into a new age. And the networks are losing their power, and that's part of their desperation. They can feel the power slipping away to the Internet and to social media. So we have someone here who's redefined modern politics, and uh, a lot of people don't like it. And some of his own staff uh, don't fully understand it, but I think he knows uh, what he's doing. Um, In your book, did you research, obviously, why Hillary Clinton lost? I know the the votes weren't there for the Electoral College, but— what, what was it that people that rubbed people the wrong way about Hillary? Well, there were many things. The two little uh, vignettes I come away with that were so obvious. You remember Obama after the election, he said, I could have won. And he said that because of two big boxes that were left unchecked. One was the Catholic vote. He, she made no attempt to win the Catholic vote, insulted the Catholic vote with those emails, never corrected it publicly refused to go to Notre Dame uh, for St. Patrick's Day when her husband, Bill, was begging her to do it. So you can't reject 22 percent of the people who vote uh, so openly. You've got to, like Trump, say, hey, what do you got to lose? You've got to make an appeal for them. And then the second was the evangelicals. White evangelicals voted 81 percent for Trump. Twenty six percent of the vote was white evangelical. And Trump been over backwards reaching for it. So you can't have your celebrities on stage saying, F Donald Trump and Jesus F in Christ, please vote for Hillary Clinton and expect to get many evangelical votes. Uh, that's why Obama was 
very frustrated. He had made a, a singular effort to win the evangelical vote. And Hillary just absolutely, those boxes weren't even checked. She didn't even try. So you can call Donald Trump dumb, but at least he's smart enough to check all the boxes off before the election. All right. He is Doug Weed, presidential historian and author of the book Game of Thorns, the inside story of Hillary Clinton's failed campaign and Donald Trump's winning strategy. Doug, thanks so much for joining us. Good luck with the book. Appreciate it. Thank you so, so much. Thanks. And he joined us on our turnkey.pro answer line. Connect with Dan and Amy using the AM560 mobile app. Download it today at 560theanswer.com slash mobile.